The AWARE Project's aim is to balance the public conversation about psychedelics, spread accurate information, and give a new face to psychedelia. We feel that this change will occur through connection and relationship, one individual at a time. We are calling on everyone whose lives have been improved through the mindful use of psychedelics to educate themselves and become ambassadors for the psychedelic experience. Show those around you that people who use psychedelics mindfully cross all social, racial, economic, and political boundaries. All right, so um, today's speaker is a colleague of mine. We both um, work um, associated with um, Crossroads Treatment Center, which is an Ibogaine um, clinic that is in Tijuana um, that works with both uh, Ibogaine and Phegamio DMT toad medicine. And um, I'm just really thrilled to have Charles here, and he's, and he's been a, a, a good friend for, a fast friend. We haven't known each other too long, but it was just a kindred spirit, so it's been really exciting to, to get to know each other, and um, uh, we're really excited to have you and to be continue to connect and, and highlight some of the local um, people working in this field. Um, so with that, I want to hand it over to Charles. Thank you. Hi everyone, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. Um, my name is Charles, Charles Johnston, and I was asked to speak at the AWARE Project about a month ago, and so I was just said yes immediately, because I've been to some of the events that Ashley's hosted that are awesome, and I'm super passionate about psychedelics. My expertise, a little bit about me, um, I have a degree in anthropology from UCLA, that's kind of the, the least important thing of my life with my college career. What is really, uh, what really defines me is my experience with psychedelics and my work with psychedelics. And so I grew up in a very closed off environment. I was raised in North Carolina. I spent the first 23 years of my life as a Mormon. And so I was to be told and taught not to alter my consciousness in any way for most of my life, which I adhered to strictly. And I thought that people that did that were uh, foolish and I had no understanding whatsoever of any of it. Which is interesting because my parents were both former hippies and followed the dead and that kind of thing. And I remember my dad reading The Spirit Molecule when I was a teenager for some reason, but I had no idea what he was talking about. And so I was raised in this religion when I was young and when I was 23 I decided that something wasn't working for me. I, I even spent two years of my life promoting the religion, riding around on a bicycle and wearing a name tag and knocking on people's doors. <laughs> and so I was very, very devoted and intense about that part of my life until I realized that, that part of my life wasn't making me happy. It wasn't providing me the experience that I wanted out of life and it wasn't giving me what I needed. And so when I was 23, I had the opportunity to experience psilocybin for the first time. And fortunately for me, I didn't get too involved with alcohol or cigarettes or kind of the, the legal intoxicants. I went straight for cannabis and then psilocybin very quickly. And I remember that first journey very vividly because it was in that moment that I realized that there was something much more to life than what I had experienced for so long. And so after that experience, I said, okay, I was living in Arizona at the time. I was studying to be a doctor, thought I wanted to be a doctor. And I said, okay, well, fuck this. I'm not doing this anymore. And I left my religion. I moved to Los Angeles and I decided I was going to be an actor. <laughs> that lasted about three months, and uh, I said, okay, fuck this, I'm not going to do it, I'm go back to school. But at that same time, I started to experience altered states of consciousness, and somewhat with reckless abandon. Um, I started doing cocaine, and MDMA, started growing all varieties of different entheogens, and eventually, uh, I found myself, after a little while, because I think what I'd gone through in my life, I found myself using heroin. And so I then went through the greatest part of my education of my life, which was a three-year heroin addiction, where I had the opportunity to really, really learn what 
humility is like because I was one of those people that when I saw people that had addiction, I thought, oh, they're just weak-willed. They just don't have any control over their, their life or what they do, and they're just bad decision makers. And so when I started using heroin, I still thought that. And it's, it was very subtle, you know, it was very, very subtle, this experience, which made me feel great, which alleviated the tension and the loss that I had felt from letting go of my faith that I had been with for so long. And suddenly I was like, oh, I'm whole again. I'm good. Well, that naturally progressed as it does into a much more serious uh, lifestyle where I was eventually losing jobs, crashing cars, putting needles in my arm, and committing crime, flunking out of school. And so during this time, I still was a very avid psychonaut. I had the opportunity to meet many people and explore psychedelic with many people. And that was something that even in an early stage, as soon as I had those experiences, I said to myself, this is what I want to do for people. This is what I want to share with people. This is the most important thing about my life. And so I started to do that. Well, in my heroin addiction, I thought, well, there's, there's got to be a way out of this. There's got to be a way that I can get out of this addiction. So I tried everything I could think of. I tried you know, mushrooms, acid, MDMA, DMT. I did everything I could try to beat this addiction until finally it got to a point that after trying dozens and dozens of times different things, I said, I, I don't know what to do. And so I was arrested uh, New Year's Eve, or yeah, New Year's Eve of 2012, I believe it was, and I spent the night in jail in Las Vegas, concerned that I was gonna be detoxing over New Year's, and you know, as, as they go, you don't get let out of jail if there's a holiday, so I was super scared sitting there in the jail cell <laughs> going, oh fuck, I'm gonna be going through withdrawals for four days here in this jail cell in Vegas. And by some stroke of luck, I, I feel that I've been blessed, that the universe has been watching out for me, they let me out of my own cognizance at 2 a.m. in the morning. I went back to where I was staying, and the next day I went back to L.A. And I said, okay, well, what do I do here? What do I do now? Because I'm in a super serious hole, because this is just getting worse. The overdoses are happening more. My life is getting really unmanageable. And I went back to something that I'd known about for quite some time, just because I was a peruser of heroin, I had the opportunity to learn about Ibogaine very early on in my career, but I was very scared. It was something that did not seem like I wanted to do it, did not seem like it was something that would, that would help me because it was something that kills people sometimes. That was my, my impression. And it was not a recreational experience. <coughs> and for me, psychedelics up until that time were all about having fun and experiencing something awesome. So I was like, all right, I don't know what to do here with this, but I received uh, my final scholarship check in the mail, um, which I eventually had to pay back because I had failed all my classes the previous semester, but I got it and I said, okay, what am I gonna do with this? Am I gonna go buy dope or am I gonna go to Mexico and do this? I have, I have one shot at this and I was at the point of killing myself, so I just said, well, I'm going to go try this, and if it doesn't work, I'll just take my handgun and finish, finish the job, because I don't want to continue with this lifestyle. So I got on a bus, and I went down to Mexico, and I walked across the border, and I was picked up by, uh, by the group of the place that I went to. And I remember sitting in the car and just breaking down and crying, because I was at an utter loss. I didn't know what to do with my life, and I didn't know I was in shock at what it had come to. And so I go to the, the place where I was to do Ibogaine, I waited a couple days, and then finally they gave me the medicine. And I was very apprehensive, I was scared. It was probably the first time I was really scared to do a drug, uh, which, is, which is weird given, given all the other drugs I've done so many times, I was kind of scared. But uh, they, they gave me this medicine, I remember laying in bed, and Ibogaine, is an interesting medicine in comparison to most other psychedelics because it, it's not 
I would say it's not the kind of guaranteed experience that you might think. Most people with Ibogaine don't get what they expect. Uh, it's, it, you know, it's just not, it's not what you expect. And so I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, I'm going to see all this crazy stuff, all these visions, all this stuff, and nothing's happening. And I'm like, oh, shit. Did I just waste all my money for this, you know? And I wasn't in withdrawal, so that was okay. And I'm, I'm sitting there, I have an intense purge experience, which I didn't know how to integrate at the time. And then after about halfway through, something <coughs> happened, and it was probably the first real miracle in my life that I was recognizably something that I understood as a miracle. Because it was in that moment that I felt self-love again, that I finally let go of the hatred and the pain that I was holding on to with the addiction. And something I learned later was that addiction really is that, it's self-hatred. There's no other way to look at it. It's just self-abuse and uh, a lack of love for yourself in your life. And so I was able to let go of all that and my experience essentially ended. I don't remember anything from that point on besides just bawling. So I, I came through the next day and I had about two days of recovery where I was super wiped out. And then I remember waking up after sleeping for the first time and I was brand new. And so I said, whoa, you know, what, what's going on? I'm, I'm me again. And so someone at the center I was with, he knew what I was interested in. I was studying at UCLA. My goal was to go work for MAPS. Um, I actually went to Santa Cruz at one point, went and knocked on the door of their little building there. No one was home at the time, but I didn't know what else to do. And I was, at that time, I was still in addiction. But uh, he, I told him about what my interest was with entheogens. And he said, well, why don't we do this? And I said, OK. Kind of just like when uh, they asked me to speak today, that's kind of how I approach life, is when, when an opportunity comes, you trust your gut, you just say, okay, yes. And so I came back to LA with him and I started working in the Ibogaine industry by myself, by doing it, by helping people go to Mexico and, and establishing that for people. And so for the last four years, I've been working in this industry. I've been helping to build clinics, establish clinics, and help people do the medicine, sit by their bedside, clean up after them, be with them, and then also be on the other side as far as talking to them, helping them do go to Mexico, talking to their families, and working with them afterwards. <clears throat> and so I've been doing that for a number of years, working at different clinics, different retreat centers in Central America. And in the last six months, uh, I decided that I wanted to do something a little bit different. Because with Ibogaine and addiction, addiction is such a complex issue. Um, for anyone that's done plant medicine, you know, we, we go into those experiences, we often have intention, we often kind of know what we're getting into, and our state of mind is fairly conscious. When you're dealing with addiction, though, a lot of people go into that experience very very in a, in a low state of consciousness because they're consumed by the drugs that they're using. And so they don't know what they're getting into and they go through this experience and then afterwards they really don't know how to work with it. You know, the most common description of Ibogaine is it's intense. <laughs> but they, they, they don't know even a lot of times how to relate that or how to unpack that experience. And so I, I, after doing this for years, I said, okay, well, I want to understand more about how I can help these people and help them do better in their, their progress in coming out of addiction because I feel that I was very fortunate in my experience and I wanted to be able to help others do that in a better way because realistically, when you look at the numbers of Ibogaine, uh, it's much better than typical addiction rates of success, which are sometimes in the single digits, but it's really, it's still pretty low as far as I'm concerned. You know, it's still one out of four, one out of three people go through this experience and come out and are able to walk back into life and, and get on with it, which to me is, is a partial success. I feel that with plant medicine, there are, there's always a better way to do it and to help people do better and succeed. And addiction is something that is probably the most challenging, one of the most challenging things to deal with. So for the last six months, I started a aftercare 
an integration space for people who come out of Ibogaine treatment and have the opportunity <coughs> to spend some time away from home and not go right back in their environment so that I could teach them the things that I've learned over the years and help them really make the most out of that experience. And so I actually have, have some of my students here in the back, they're kind of all smiling. But uh, it's been an amazing six months, a challenging six months, and I've learned a lot. So that's really what I want to share with you guys today are the things that I've learned through this, this journey that I've had, and especially what I've learned in the last, last half year of my work with people. <coughs> And so, um, they, you know, most of my students, they come from Crossroads, and they do Ibogaine in a medical setting, and then they also do 5-MeO-DMT. And so then they come to me, and I get to figure out how to work with this situation. And so, I want to break it down into three, three areas of the experience. You know, you have, you have preparation for the experience. You have the experience itself and integration. And so first I want to talk about preparation for this kind of experience and for entheogens in general. This is just, this is all my personal experience and I've, I've had the opportunity to facilitate many times, many different medicines and uh, my knowledge keeps growing so this is definitely not my definitive you know, my final outcome on all this, but I do want to, I feel it's growing a lot. Um, with preparation, a lot of people go into these experiences, as I, as I said, um, almost unable to really be prepared because of where they're at mentally. And so I think it's really important, there's a, key, a few key points for them as far as getting through that experience. First, expectations, setting expectations, both for them and for yourself. One of the most common issues that I run into with Ibogaine is that people come out of it and they go, well, I didn't get any visions. And I say, <laughs> I say who told you you were gonna have visions? Because that's not what happens for most people. It's like, one in three, I didn't have visions, I've done it six times, no visions. So it's, that's how it goes. Um, something that a lot of people misunderstand about entheogens is they expect to have some beautiful visionary, and with ayahuasca too, some snake showing up in their vision. With Ibogaine, they expect some movie screen to scroll down and show them their whole life. And what I've learned and what I tell people now is stop looking for things and notice what's there. It's not always, for most people, a visionary experience. It's a lot of times it's a, it's a comprehension, it's a knowing that happens. And that really, setting the stage for that and helping them understand first and foremost that this probably isn't going to be what you're hoping for. And that really you have to walk in there and just say, man, I, I just hope to get something out of this, is what you need to understand, right? And so, unfortunately, the internet's out there. And people, people read all kinds of wild tales about all kinds of stuff. And it's both a, a positive and a negative. And I think for anyone who's, who's working with these medicines or facilitating or telling their friends about entheogens or who are in addiction or looking to use entheogens to help them get themselves out of it, is to really help them understand that in the experience, what they need to do is not look outward, but look inward, right? To look to delve in in the experience and to start to confront the things that started the issue in the first place. So preparation, I think, is very important. And setting, the, the, the setting and the space that you create and the type of facilitators that you put people around is really important. And that's another thing that is somewhat challenging because there's a lot of people in both in, in my industry and in the general community who are serving medicine and working with medicine and really aren't, aren't ready to be doing that work or aren't even sometimes willing to do that work but are doing it because it's a job. Because that's what you find due to prohibition, you, we have to work in Mexico to do Ibogaine. And unfortunately, a lot of cases is you have people in a culture who don't look at 
the medicines as medicines. And they don't understand the difficulty of what we're going through and what we want to achieve with these medicines. And so having proper space and proper facilitation, and I'm sure I know Ashley can attest to this too, is, is so vital. And I would say in my, in my experience with that is that you really, you really want people to understand that the people that they're gonna be around, the people they're gonna be working with, need to have compassion and need to know the medicines that they're working with deeply. Um, so that, that's really important, and then, and then the setting as well. <clears throat> with Ibogaine, unlike any other entheogen, you're often dealing with a setting that is clinical. Uh, because there is the chance of, of cardiac difficulties, because there's a chance of someone dying, you have to put people in an environment where they're being essentially hospitalized, where they're in a bed, where they're being monitored, and where there's doctors and nurses walking around making sure everything's okay. It's a give and a take, you know. Um, I feel that there's going to be a lot more growth in understanding this medicine and helping that be a better experience for a lot of people. Because when you go to the other end of the spectrum, which I've worked in both, where you have someone just working in a bedroom or with, you know, in a much more closed environment that's simple, uh, you face some of the similar challenges, which is the space isn't very ceremonial. And Ibogaine is looked at either as a detox or as a spiritual tool. And the integration of the two it needs to, needs to happen. And so that's something that I've been very, very adamant about when I've worked with clinics and something that I feel going forward, working with this medicine is going to be monumental because if people don't feel comfortable about their safety, well, then that's, that's a challenge. But then if they don't feel comfortable about what's actually going on in the experience and they think they're in some insane asylum and they start hallucinating that they're being you know, their kidneys are getting taken, then it's, it's scary too, right? So both those things are really important, and that set the stage for the experience. Um, the experience of Ibogaine is, is a unique one because you're incapacitated. For anyone that's done it, they know that when you take the medicine, you're really limited on how much you can move. You can't really get up and walk around. You can barely move around without getting nauseous for a lot of people. And so you're in this state of almost, uh, you know, you're in a paralysis of sorts. And at the same time, your mind is just getting worked, you know. It's like on hyperdrive. And all this stuff's happening and running through your head. And, and you know, there's, there's things happening visually, but then you close your eyes and there's sometimes nothing happening. Sometimes there's all kinds of things happening. My, my biggest thing that I've learned working both with the medicine and also working with, with uh, 5-MeO-DMT is something that I feel is very important and maybe steps on the toes of the way some people do medicine, but I think an active facilitation is very important for both of those medicines, especially for people coming out of addiction. Because one, they're going in, they don't know what to expect. A lot of the things, a lot of the words that are being said to them beforehand are not being heard because they're clouded by drug use. So then they get in the experience and everything that you've told them is out the window, right? And if you kind of leave them alone and take a very, uh, what I think is a very masculine approach of kind of, oh, go deal with your, go deal with your issues, a lot of times people don't. They don't. They come out of the experience and say it was terrible, nothing happened and they don't really confront what needs to be confronted. And I personally, from my experience working uh, with the Bweedy a few times as well, have seen that an active facilitation is important, that there needs to be some sense of psychotherapy work done in the experience. Maybe not throughout the entire experience, but both leading in and both letting down so that they can really get the most out of it. And that does include walking up and having a conversation with them and sometimes prompting, prompting things into them. And I know, you know, after listening to Rick Doblin talk about the, the MDMA therapy and kind of how they do that and how it's, it's uh, 
you know, the facilitators or the therapists wait for the person to talk to them. I, you know, in my experience, I think that sometimes you have to, you have to prod. You have to, because when you're dealing with people in addiction, they don't want to ask the questions a lot of times. They want the easy answer. They want to just be told. And sometimes if, they, if they're not told, if they're not pushed, if they're not pressed on what needs to be, what needs to be worked on, then nothing gets worked on. And they come out of it and they don't really know what happens. So this is something that I started experimenting with, with 5-MeO-DMT, is having the opportunity to, in the experience, have some sense of psychotherapy, to prepare them for that extreme experience, to allow them to feel that someone's there connected to them through the experience, and allow them to delve into it. And I'll, I'll talk more about that later with my integration work that we've been doing. But I, I think that's probably one of the most important things that I've learned from the experience. And as I said, in my, in my work with ayahuasca, I've been to Peru and I know that it's, it's a very hands-off approach, you know, in, in, in a, well, in the circles I've always been in. And I think when dealing with this issue, it has to be much more integrated from, from the outset. Integration doesn't have to wait till the experience is over. Integration can happen right then and there in the experience. Um, so, yeah, so the experience is, uh, is really important to have facilitators that are there with them, feeling the experience with them, being with them, being connected in the experience. And that doesn't mean the facilitator needs to be on the medicine, but that does mean the facilitator needs to have some, some connection, some contact with the medicine so that they can actually resonate on the same frequency and, and feel what's happening. And then there's the integration. So people come out of Ibogaine and they're trashed. <laughs> they're, they're, they're like zombies for a couple of days. They can't walk can't sleep, can't eat, you, you feel like garbage, you know? And I encountered this, and most everyone encounters this, and it's one of the great challenges to, as someone working with this, and, and to feel empathy, but not try to fix the situation, which I can say that I'm, I've been a culprit of, of, trying to fix the situation instead of allowing the person to experience it and deal with it. Because there's a fine line between between helping and assisting, right? Helping is, is doing it for them and assisting is being there and supporting. Um, with integration, <clears throat> when people come out of the experience, those first couple of days, they need to be held, they need to be comforted, they need to be provided proper nutrition, they need to be provided with proper physical activities. I remember when I first started doing this, uh, People would come out of the IBM experience, and the day after, they'd be just laying around, couldn't do anything, couldn't walk, couldn't do anything. And I would reflect back to my experience, <coughs> and I would say, all right, get up. And I'd get them up, and we'd go for a walk, and they'd be trying to do it. And I remember when I did that, too, and it just, it, I walked, I don't know, 100 yards, and it killed me. It was so hard. But they, ha they have to be pushed at some level. And with addiction especially, people are so used to being comforted, they're so used to the easy path, that you have to start them in that immediate process of pushing them, making them uncomfortable. My students know one of the main things I stress is being uncomfortable all the time. <laughs> all the time. I, I, just being around me is uncomfortable sometimes. <laughs> But I, I, I stress being uncomfortable because for all of us as people, we get stuck in these routines. And the only way we grow is to be uncomfortable. And the only way we let go of addiction, i.e. attachment, is to be in discomfort. And so forcing that on someone, they're already very uncomfortable, but you have to, you have to gently push them and keep prodding them and do so in a way that they feel that you understand that they feel that it's best for them, and that they eventually, they have to do it. You know, they, they just have to, there's no other way around it if they want to overcome what they're dealing with. So then once they get past the physical stuff, they, they're better, 
Their, their mind is very clear, they're, they're sharp, they feel good usually, they're pretty straight. And then comes the real work. I know it seemed like all that other stuff was a lot of work, now comes the real work, which is where they start their long-term integration. And so the, the title of my talk was Entheogenic Medicine, Addiction, and Integration, but it's, it's the subheader of um, uh, rediscovering self with practical spirituality. One of the main things that I've discovered, that I've realized, and this may seem obvious to a lot of people, but in our country we look at rehabilitation as this idea that, okay, once we get you off drugs, you're going to be fine. Unfortunately, when you, when you look at the word rehabilitation, when you look at some of the definitions, one of the definitions of rehabilitation is to go back to a previous state. Well, unfortunately, most of these people that I work with, their previous state is in their teenage years. It's in their formative years. It's, it's well before they were self-sufficient, autonomous adults. Well before they actually really had to take on responsibility and accountability. So then you're, you're, you're confronted with this thing of, okay, now we have to advance maturity in a rapid way, really rapid. And so that's what I've been working on for the last six months is helping my students really progress in that place in their life and looking not at not as it as addiction recovery, but as just life coaching, a, a habilitation, learning to be a normal, stable adult. And so some of the things that we do which are really interesting that I, you know, I feel fortunate to have been shown and, and work with some of the people I work with, is we do a lot of alternative medicine. We do a lot of things that make people uncomfortable. Um, this morning we had the opportunity to do Cambo with some of our guests, and that's something we make uh, a weekly activity, and I make sure that everyone does it a few times. Like Cambo, if anyone's unfamiliar, is the Amazonian frog poison from the giant waxy tree frog. And it's a very rapid detox. You burn little holes in your skin and you put this frog poison which gets into your lymphatic system and causes a severe reaction. And so the purpose of this medicine is to detox, to re-engage the circulatory system, to re-engage the endocrine system and to help people release spiritual and energetic trauma. A lot of our students are dealing with trauma from childhood, from parents who, who instilled in them values that are no longer serving them, uh, experiences they've had through their addiction, the trauma of addiction. That's something I had to go through, was the, the experience of just living in addiction is traumatic extremely traumatic. You see people dying. You are dying yourself, literally killing yourself on a daily basis. So how do you let go of all this? How do you get rid of all this? It takes time. It's not a one-trick pony. You can do medicine, you're good. You got to continue. And fortunately, I've been in the community. I've done a lot of plant medicine over the four years, so I've been blessed to be able to continue that path. But I'm still in my process of letting go of things in my childhood. And so we do things like Cambo to really help them let go. We push them, we make them do meditation, but we also take them to isolation tanks and put them in deep meditation. We take them to cryotherapy, we take them to Kundalini Yoga. And the, the number one thing with all of these activities that we're doing, uh, we even do Sananga, even drop liquid fire in their eyes <laughs> and, and make them sit with it. Sananga is another Amazonian medicine that put drops in your eyes and it burns like hell. And I tell them every time, I say, be with this experience, love this discomfort, because until you love this, until you embrace it, and stop trying to escape, it's gonna keep hurting. Just like life, life is gonna keep hurting you if you keep trying to run from the pain and from the challenging suffering parts. So, <clears throat> We, we constantly are pushing them and using as many things as we can from the jungle and from modern <coughs> alternative therapies to give them the opportunity 
to experience a whole wide range of healing modalities, and at the same time, to make them realize that they are so much more powerful than they originally thought. That they are so much more accomplished than they originally thought. And I bring them back to the principles of accountability, humility, and what I feel most important, gratitude. And gratitude for everything that they've been through. Gratitude for addiction. As I, I started talking to you, I said, you know, my, my most important education was my three years as a drug addict. I wouldn't trade that for the world. I wouldn't understand anything I understand about life at this point if I hadn't happened. And so recognizing and, and owning that and saying this is who I am and I love who I am and I love that I went through that experience as hard as it is. I love that I witnessed those traumatic events as hard as that is. That, that's the keynote. That's really where that maturity starts to develop because then you start realizing that the universe isn't doing things to you, it's doing things for you, right? You start to understand that your path is the path that you're supposed to be on. And that's very challenging for a lot of people to realize. So that is what I've been doing uh, for the last six months and it, it's, it's been a beautiful process. It's definitely not perfect. And there's a, lot, there's a lot to grow from. There's a lot to learn from all the time. And, you know, then, then the longer term, what do they do even after they go to us? Some of, the, some of the things that we have them do is a lot of our people move back to San Diego. We actually have some people that go woofing. Um, so if anyone doesn't know what that is, it's organic farming. There's a huge network of organic farmers around the world. And some of our students are here from their farms. Um, and getting them out there, putting them on their own. Because there's a, there's a point where they have to go, they have to fly, and they have to release and let go. And that's one of the things from the, from the place of where they're coming from, a lot of them have to disconnect from the former life. They have to reshape their self. They have to let go of everything they thought they were. They have to let go of the way they thought their parents are. They have to let go of the way they think they are. They have to change the way they listen to music, the music they listen to. They have to change the movies they watch. They have to change the way they talk, transformational language, letting go of certain words. They have to start engaging in new activities, reading, uh, writing, meditating, and just telling their story and starting to embrace their story and realize that they are beautiful people. So it's, it's been a wonderful experience and, you know, Fortunately, we get to work with plant medicine. It's not nearly as challenging as I think what people go through in the mainstream. I don't know why anyone works in addiction in the mainstream. They have to be crazy <laughs> because, you know, for what they have to deal with. I mean, I, I'm fortunate because people usually come to me, they're pretty fresh, they're malleable. Man, when they're coming just straight from that, I can't even imagine. And so it's a... Uh, it's been a great blessing, and I, and I look forward to more I'll get to learn, more medicines I'll get to use, more opportunities I'll get to present them to, and exposing them to a whole new way of life and allowing them to experience entheogens in a new way and ultimately change their life for good and, and be an example for their family and everything that they stand for. So, thank you. That's all I have. Uh, Any questions anyone has? Yeah. Um, first of all, I really appreciate the talk. Very, very enlightening and heartfelt. Um, something you said uh, I was hoping you could elaborate on, and uh, you were speaking about facilitating experiences, and uh, that you endorse the idea of not being a passive facilitator, but more an active facilitator. Mm -hmm. I'm a big Stan Groff fan. Mm. And his his style, at least previous, is reactive mm. facilitation. And um, you know, there's different ways I can go down. You mentioned the word prodding, and you also kind of explain why, particularly with the, the group that you work with. But I was wondering if you could say more about what active facilitation looks like for you. Yeah. So I, you know, I'll, I'll give a couple examples, and um, I'll give two examples. One, 
One that I had recently was being in Mexico and facilitating a, a 5 meo DMT experience, and oftentimes that can be an overwhelming experience. And so I, I kind of gradually approach that with them and kind of lead them into that slowly. But even with that, people get very scared. They get freaked out. And sometimes you see this different person come out and they start pleading for help. They start pleading for attention. They start needing something. And there's a part of me and the way I learned to work with that medicine was to stand off and not work, not, not affect their experience, allow them to go through it. But I realized that some people need to be comforted. They need to be held. They need their head to be touched. They need their hand to be held. They need some sort of physical touch. And sometimes they need someone to say, it's okay when they say they're scared. When they say they're dying, they need someone to tell them it's okay. Go for it. Let it go. You know, just some simple, some simple phrases I found can be very powerful in, in helping people get to that place when they when they come back from that that highest bardo and they come back into their ego and they go they say something to you if you can say something and be in that experience with them and help them to kind of connect back into it and let let their ego dissolve again it, it can do wonders because even though they're scared even though they're dealing with it, they know they're not totally alone they know that there's someone there with them they know that they're being, they're being comforted. Um, with Iboga, I, I worked in Costa Rica for a little while and I got to work with Iboga. And I got to see a different way of doing Iboga where the shaman would actually come around and would guide you, would, would tap you on the head, would tap you on the forehead, <laughs> and would literally sit there and guide you and talk to you through this experience and go through the questions that you have in the medicine. And, and work through this process with you, which I think is is very can be very valuable. It's something that that's with Ibogaine or Boga. I'm just starting to understand how to work with that and how to guide that. Um, and then another example is with with Cambo, when people are having discomfort, a lot of discomfort, and the the purpose of the Cambo is to purge, to get it out, right. Some people are very resistant to getting it out. Some people will hold on so tight, they won't let anything go. And the same thing with 5-MeO-DMT. People will hold on so tight, they won't let it go. And as a facilitator, you can either just sit there and watch this happen, and then the, the medicine wears off and they brick-walled it. Or you can say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something to urge this along. And something that I do is I try to, I, I, because I get to know people, I delve in. And I say, hey, I want you to think about this. I want you to deal with this. Approach this topic of your life. And, and I just kind of whisper it to them and I push them into thinking about the very thing that they're scared of, the very thing, the trauma that they don't want to let go of. And then eventually, hopefully, the goal is, is by, by pushing that into their mind, by forcing that into their awareness, that it'll then erupt and come out. And this is just something that I discovered for myself doing ayahuasca was I found that I don't, I don't purge. It's very uncommon for me to purge, but if I can consciously start to go back and look at the things in my life and my trauma, it will come, like, like clockwork. I can bring it if I want to. And so I said, okay, well, if I can do that to myself, why can't I do that with other people and help them have that same kind of expression of the medicine and let them release that. Mm -hmm. Ashley. <laughs> um, for people that may not know too much about Iboga and Ibogaine, can you give a little bit of background about them? Yeah, sure. So Iboga is from Africa, from West Central, or, yeah, West Central Africa, Gabon, in Cameroon. It is a shrub that grows there and they take the root bark and traditionally, they'll just grind up the root bark and eat it. And it contains the alkaloid. The primary alkaloid is ibogaine. And ibogaine is, for many people who read about it, it is what many would consider the most, one of the most extreme psychedelics. Um, ibogaine is very interesting. It's not super well understood at this point. 
It has many different properties. Some of the effects that it has, it has dissociative properties. So like I mentioned, it, it puts you in a state of physical dissociation, it causes actual physical ataxia, so you can't move. It affects your cardiac function sometimes, but for most people that are healthy, there's no issues with that. And then, most importantly, in relation to this topic, is that Ibogaine actually does two very important things on a person. Uh, neurochemically, it resets the uh, neurochemistry of the brain. I use the word reset because that's the most common word used, but what it actually does is it has neurogenitive properties. It upregulates certain hormones in the brain, so it actually stimulates your brain to actually repair brain cells, all right? Uh, repair the, the most important brain cells, the kind of glue of the brain, so that those damaged brain cells can then start communicating properly again. And so everyone knows with addiction, they say your brain gets hardwired wrong, gets messed up. Well, this actually allows that, that process, those wires to be basically, uh, the rubber to be put back on some stripped wires. And so that's a profound impact and it works on the dopaminergic system, serotonin, uh, works nicotinic system. It has very wide reaching effects for a lot of people on brain chemistry. So it's, as far as entheogen is concerned, I think it's, it's definitely the most promising when you're talking about healing the brain. And they've actually done some minor studies with Parkinson's where they found that it actually reverses some of the degeneration caused by Parkinson's. So that's one really interesting aspect. And then the other part of it is the spiritual side of the experience. I begin, the reason why it's referred to as one of the most intense is because it's like a punch in the face. Uh, it's, it's anywhere from, usually the peak of it is anywhere from eight to 12 hours, and then you got another 12 to 24 hours of recovery. So it's a, it's a long haul. And when you're in it, you, you, you can't go anywhere, you can't hide from it, and it's like your brain is just getting rattled. Um, a good, if you, you know, if you guys go home, look up, look up weedy music or Ibogaine music, it'll give you a good example. It's this really chaotic, non-rhythm music. That's kind of what your brain feels like. It's just all over the place. You can't focus, you can't deal with anything. But what happens is, is for people that are, have like a really marvelous experience, kind of a prototypical experience, is they'll get this opportunity to actually re-explore re memory or uh, past experience in their life almost as if they're in a dreamlike state and be able to see this, connect with it, dissociate the emotion from it, and let it go. So that's more the visual aspect. And then um, the uh, psychological aspect like I experienced, just a, a letting go, an understanding, a deep understanding that I didn't get with LSD, I didn't get with MDMA, I didn't get with ayahuasca, I didn't get with psilocybin, I didn't get with any of those things because they just didn't, they didn't push me enough. And maybe I wasn't ready at that point, but I would say for myself, I began, I needed something really strong that was gonna confront the, the worst parts about me, because it brings up your demons. Yeah? Do you guys work with the cactus as well? No, no, we haven't done any work with uh, cactus in, in Mexico or anything like that. Yeah. I work with a different disorder, like IBD, IBS, chronic Um So personally, I work with Aya and with Martin with five and okay. Um I'm more thinking, kind of a two-part question. One, what are your thoughts on gut contraindications? Mm -hmm. And two, how do you decide which medicine to use? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, with gut contraindications, you have to be careful. Um, you don't want anyone that has severe IBS, Crohn's disease, anything like that, because if the ibogaine isn't metabolized properly, then you're going to have some cardiac functions. It's also rather uncomfortable and can cause a lot of irritation. And so purging sometimes, people can purge literally for 12 hours straight, which when done, if you have gut irritation problems, can turn into blood and serious you know, serious hemorrhaging. So you, most of the time, 
you need to avoid those things. But if it's under control, it's not severe, they haven't had things removed or anything, it, it can be approached for sure. Um, as far as deciding what is the best medicine to use, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I, it really, you, you just got to get to know the person. You got to find out what works for them. I know as I did intake, I did intake for about three years. I talked to thousands of people who wanted to drive again. And for most of them, I said, hey, this is, this is okay. This is going to work for you. There's some times where I said, hey, ayahuasca is maybe a better option for you. I think, I don't think there's any wrong answer. I think all the medicines have benefit. Now, maybe some may be better at certain times than others, but I don't think you're going to make a wrong choice if you go do Ibogaine, because you're going to get what you need out of it. It's going to be the right thing for you then and there if you make that choice. It's not a wrong choice, but like, what's the most effective what? So why did you choose, in that particular moment, why did you choose Ibogaine over Ibogaine for the individual? Because their situation with addiction I didn't think was as severe. I felt that Aya, usually if someone isn't in a super severe <coughs> case of addiction, like they're not dealing with opiate addiction or methamphetamine addiction or super hard addicted drugs, um, I said, well, you know, maybe, maybe try ayahuasca first. Maybe give that one a chance, explore that first. But I still, I, you know, but I also said Ibogaine could be right for you too. There's, with Ibogaine, it's a much bigger commitment. You know, you've got to travel somewhere and you've got to, it's a, it's a large financial commitment and you're getting into a world of, you know, deepness that uh, sometimes I'm kind of like, well, maybe try something a little easier first, see if that works. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want you to hate me afterwards. Most people hate you right after, so, yeah. I know going to a addiction centers here are expensive, and I imagine they're expensive wherever you go. And then you said, then, then they reprogram their whole life, and they go into different things. Well, mm -hmm. how do they, who supports them through this? And do they, have, are there insurances that cover any of it, or is it just family? Yeah. How does it work? Yeah, usually it's family. I mean, no, no insurance company is going to cover I know. I yeah. <laughs> 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 Unless you know. If you find out any, please tell me. I'll give you. Uh, but yeah, no insurance company are going to cover any kind of entheogen therapy at this point. Um, with, with my aftercare, my, you know, what I do is intensive sober living, I haven't even approached insurance companies yet because of the fact that some of the things they're not gonna they're not gonna agree with me doing Cambo. They're not gonna agree with me going to Mexico and doing these things. And it's just gonna draw flags that I don't want to mess with. So usually it is family support. I mean almost always or personal support. Yeah. Which addiction addictions do does Ibogaine work best for? Definitely works best for opiate addictions because of the, the fact that it takes away the withdrawal symptoms, and the, most of the withdrawal symptoms for opiates. That's a huge, huge thing for most people that are suffering from heroin or uh, Oxycontin or something like that. It doesn't work for the opiate replacement therapies like Suboxone or Methadone. They actually have to switch, transition to a short-acting opiate like heroin or Oxycontin before they can do Ibogaine. So that, Opiates are definitely the main one, but I've seen a lot of success both with methamphetamine and alcoholism too. Um, neurologically, it's less less indicated as being prevalently neurochemically fixing those issues, but from a spiritual aspect, if you really look at it that way and you, you prepare them in that way and you make sure that they understand that that's what they're getting into and that's what they're getting out of it, then it, it's very profound. And then what kind of what kind of average price is someone looking at, and do they want to do it all like you've done it six times? Yeah. So I I had, I'm fortunate because I the first time I did it, I did I began I got clean I was good. And then I started working in the business. I started setting up clinics, and so the second time I did it was a year and a half later. I didn't have to pay because it was my clinic. Yeah, I was lucky. And then the other four times. I, I did Iboga, and I, again, worked for another clinic, and I had the chance to do that as part of working with the clinic. Most people, 
You know, for most people, I think they do it once or twice. Uh, the average cost is anywhere from six to seven thousand dollars average. There's some places that are four thousand. There's some places that are eight thousand. Um, I, you know, something something I wanted to touch on too earlier was I've kind of found that there's an ideal an ideal state for people to come out of addiction and. You know, there are, there are certain demographics that do better than others. And once someone gets to a point in their life where they're kind of in their mid-20s, going up to their early 40s, they have a much better window. Uh, sometimes people have to do it a couple times if they're still coming out of that, that younger, childish kind of my parents taking care of me and not knowing what they want to do with their life attitude. And so they sometimes have to do it a couple times to, to really make it click. With addiction, sometimes people, curiosity killed the cat, right? Um, fortunately, I exhausted all my curiosity with opiates when I was an opiate addict. Some people don't, you know, when they get a shot, they sometimes don't always take it. It's, that's a hard part to understand, right, you know? So I hope that kind of answers the question. Any, one last question. Any studies on the advocacy? Yeah, actually, Crossroads and uh, one of Ashley's partners, Joseph Barsuglia, has done a pretty good longitudinal study over a few years where he's looked at about 100 people and long-term their success and how well they did. And the thing to point out that I think is most interesting about that study, statistically, like I said, it's three, you know, one out of three are stay, maintain complete abstinence from one experience. Uh, but the most important thing is that 85%, I think, or 82% say it was the best treatment they've done. It was the most effective treatment. We gotta stop looking at addiction as like, boom, it's gonna be over, it's done. You know, it's, it's a process. We're all in a state of addiction. <laughs> whether it's to sugar, whether it's to food, whether it's to TV, whether it's to negative emotional states, we're all in a state of addiction unless we're Buddha. So, um, you know, being gentle with that, understanding that and supporting your loved ones that are in addiction and saying, I support you in this path. I'm not going to allow myself to be pulled under emotionally by what you're going through. I understand that this is your process. It's the best thing we can do for people because it may not happen right then and there. It may take time. And the majority of people that come out of addiction, they say mature out of addiction. So you have to build that maturity. And you only build maturity through experience. I have a question about the therapeutic value of some of the different substances you described, mm -hmm. but somewhat unrelated to the treating addiction. If there are other questions where people want to stay on the topic of addiction as it relates to some of these therapies, then I'll be glad to push back until we finish that. Right? Anyone want to push them back? <laughs> <laughs> no, go ahead. Uh, I've never. Most experience I've had with any sort of substances therapeutically has been good weed. Uh, but as it relates to, uh, <laughs> no one here has ever experienced that, right? Uh, my question relates to, I guess, the qualitative versus quantitative dis differences between some of the substances from mushrooms to hypergain or anything else. Is it more a, a quantitative difference in terms of the experience? Or are there actual qualitative differences in terms of just one not being stronger, but definitely qualitative, definitely. Um, every every entheogen has a different essence to it, has a different spirit to it, and working, you know, I've, I've used a lot myself, and I've worked with a lot of people using various ones. Certain ones just work better for certain people at certain times, you know depending on what they're dealing with, depending on what the trauma is, if you can isolate that, if you can understand at the core what's going on. Like if I get to know someone really well, I can say, okay, well, this is probably the best thing for you to start with. Um, and it may not be something extreme. It may be something like MDMA or even cannabis, just to open it up, to, to let it open a little bit. Sometimes people have very tough exteriors and you have to push them. You have to do something that is much more extreme and it's gonna force them into a state. So it definitely, definitely depends 
on what they're dealing with and specifically, you know, knowing them, getting to the core of the issue. Yeah. Last question. Last question. Um, so Make I'm it actually good. a lead therapist in the IOP program. It's literally right around the corner. Okay. Uh, and, you know, one thing that I've been thinking about a lot during your talk is uh, in most of the addiction treatment field, the 12 steps are really like still the main paradigm that people are engaged with, even if we're doing other things clinically from a more scientific standpoint. Mm -hmm. So, uh, within the 12 step community, you know, most people are not okay with using psychedelic substances. <laughs> and uh, it sounds like, you know, even post IDD detox, you know, you're using a lot of mind altering substances in the program, uh, your aftercare program, which sounds really interesting, by the way. Um, I'm wondering how your clients are either integrating or not integrating. Yeah, so, so most people that come to us are very adverse to 12 steps. They've already been through those programs, they've kind of been there, done that, heard this. And so they hear 12 step and they don't like it. I myself, I went to one meeting before I did Ibogaine and I was like, this is bullshit. <laughs> anything, that, anything that I walk in there and I say I'm, I'm an addict and that's kind of the mentality, I was like, oh, that's totally demoralizing. That's totally like, defeats the purpose of what I want to accomplish. Um, interestingly enough, within the last few weeks, I started reading the big book, I'm Almost Done, because I realized that the 12 steps at its core is like an entheogenic experience. <laughs> it's no different, right? It's finding a higher power, right? Doing the medicine. It's exploring a moral, having a moral inventory, going within, looking at the deficits that you have with your character, and then releasing and letting them go. The only difference is, is you're doing it on your own. You don't have to go make amends to your friends or whatever, and then hopefully get to that point where you're then advocating and helping other people with what you've developed in your recovery. I think the 12-step model can be perfectly integrated into entheogenic experience, and we actually do work with some 12-step aspects. We take them to meetings <coughs> times. We sometimes have them do inventories. We have meeting groups on our own where we discuss some of those similar principles. But it has to be done in a totally different way because the culture of 12-step is not so good, you know? And that's the thing that I want to separate from. That's the thing that I, when I go to meetings, even when I've gone to meetings recently, I look around and I see these people that are kind of just beat, you know? And they don't understand some of the most simple things about the way they're living their lives that are non-functional, right? The way they dress, the way they talk, the way they interact with each other. They kind of get stuck in that kind of, I'm working the steps. I don't need to change any of these just basic functions of what I'm doing. So I think there needs to be a drastic evolution incorporating both. Um, and you know, we're, we are doing it in tandem and it's just gonna get better and grow more for sure. So, and, and I'll say this too, we do a lot of work with non-ordinary states of consciousness. Not always mind altering substances. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. that's, that's cool. And yeah. just as a follow up, you know, a lot of the clients that I work with are like you, you know, they may have been addicted to heroin or whatever, but they also had positive experiences with psychedelics. And, mm -hmm. you know, the 12 step program is telling them basically you can never do this again. Yeah. And so I have a lot of clients, you know, like kind of in a state of despair about that. Well, yeah, because, yeah. and that's the other thing is abstinence, right? Bill, Bill W., I mean, we all know Bill W. did LSD. Like, the idea of abstinence is just, it's so, it's so, like, Western American culture, and it's, it's foolish. It's simple. That's one, that's one big disagreement I have and the way that they kind of approach that. Yeah. So thank you, everyone, for listening. We really appreciate it.